Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our April Borough Service Cabinet meeting. Um, for those of you that are new in the room, I'm Andrew Gennardis. I am the Borough President's General Counsel. The Borough President should be joining us in a few minutes, uh, and the Deputy Borough President, I believe, is on her way as well, but we're going to get started uh, anyway, because I know everyone has a busy, busy day, and you can't wait for the good weather later on in the afternoon. Uh, so before we get started, we'll call the roll, start with the community boards. Community Board 1. Present. Community Board 2. Present. Community Board 3. Community Board 4. Community Board 5. Present. Community Board 6. Community Board 7. <laughs> Community Board 8. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Present. Community Board 11. Present. Community Board 12. Community Board 13. Community Board 14. Community Board 15. Here. Community Board 16. Here. Community Board 17. Here. Community Board 18. Okay. City agencies, administration for children's services. Present. Aging. Public library, buildings, city planning, DCAS, Commission on Human Rights, Con Ed, Consumer Affairs, Corrections, Design and Construction, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Environmental Protection, Finance, Fire, Health and Mental Hygiene, Homeless Services, HPD, Human Resources, Do It. National Grid, NY City Transit, Present. Community Assistance Unit, Community Affairs, Department of Parks and Recreation, Police Brooklyn North, Police Brooklyn South, Probation, Sanitation Brooklyn North, Sanitation Brooklyn South, Small business services? Here. Transportation? Here. DYCD? Here. Postal service? 311? State Comptroller? Okay. So we have a quorum and established. Also, we have uh, anyone from any of the council members' offices present? I know we have one person. You might just announce yourself so we have it on the record. Sorry? Thank you. <coughs> and now we'll turn it over to our Deputy Borough President. Good morning, everyone. I see we're having agencies getting um, coming in perhaps later, I'm expecting what would be more participation from the agencies. Um, but as we continue this morning, I want to thank Commissioner Kevin Jeffrey, who's here with us today, this morning and every month, um, going out of his way as far as our Brooklyn Commissioner is concerned. And uh, we're trying to make sure that we have uh, conversations with uh, the department commissioners to make sure that borough commissioners are going to be attending these meetings so that we can be productive. Um, there's an opportunity here for us to be able to uh, mitigate a lot of issues that continue to be raised at these meetings, and we need the cooperation of our agencies. So I want to thank um, those of you that are here today, present, um, as we 
Welcome everyone this morning. I want to just um, make some announcements. On March 24th, the Borough President hosted Police Commissioner Branton for a meet and greet with faith-based and civic leaders from across the borough. Those in attendance also included the commanding officers of each of the Brooklyn's police precincts and bureau chiefs for community affairs, housing, transit, and tra transportation divisions. Um, we had a sea of blue in that room. On April 1st, the borough president hosted a town hall forum on Vision Zero with city council speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, as well as all council members from uh, the city council mem the city council that were invited to participate. Uh, DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg uh, was addressing the very important issues of pedestrian safety across the borough. Um, I want to just share with you that Brooklyn has been leading uh, in respect to what would be accidents uh, with pedestrians, uh, fatal accidents, um, which is something that we're monitoring uh, very, very closely. And we're pushing uh, more so than ever Vision Zero. This is one of uh, the most prevalent ways to be able to uh, deal with a lot of what has been happening as far as pedestrian safety is concerned, and we want to make sure that we advance the Vision Zero campaign uh, so that it can be implemented sooner than later. The borough president has officially proclaimed April as Financial Literacy Empowerment Month. Throughout the month of April, we have an organized a series of borough-wide empowerment and education events including workshops on budgeting, credit scores, financial family planning, identity theft, student loans, and more. This initiative will culminate with a financial literacy empowerment event at Borough Hall on April 29th. You can visit www.brooklyn-usa.org backslash financial literacy empowerment for more information and we welcome you to participate if you want further um, events as far as specific areas where these particular uh, financial literacy workshops are going to be taking place on the website you will see different dates in different communities on Friday April 11th the borough president will also host a Garifuna heritage event at Borough Hall all are welcomed. I hope you can all join us. This event will celebrate Garifuna culture. Garifuna are descents of West African, Central African, Carib, Arawak people and live primarily in Central America today. The event is at 6 p.m. and is open to the public. On Wednesday, April 30th, from 4 to 8 p.m., Borough Hall is hosting a tax lien sale outreach event along with New York City Departments of Environmental Protection Finance and Housing and Preservation and Development, HPD. And we ask that people share that information because uh, there are hundreds of people on the tax lien sale list. And in order to address those liens, uh, making sure that you come to these events are the one, the very first opportunity people will have to be able to settle those debts. Uh, be able to discuss a payment plan and these debts are uh, one particular uh, issue as far as uh, people going into foreclosure because of them and so we want to make sure that Brooklyn Knights are addressing what would be uh, unpaid bills that relate to what would be their water bills their tax bills their property tax bills um, we want to make sure that people are keeping their homes and now I'd like to introduce Italia Guerrero, Grand Shaw, because she did uh, get married, I apologize, uh, to talk about Safe Sleep Initiative, and that's an initiative that the borough president is, va is advancing um, in Borough Hall. Uh, good morning, everybody. Everyone looks so cheery today. Um, Italia Grand Shaw from the borough president's office. A lot of you know me, I've been here for a while. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our Safe Sleep Brooklyn campaign. Um, we're kicking it off officially here on May 8th. It's an uh, initiative with the Borough President and Delta Children to educate parents on safe sleeping 
safe, a safe sleeping environment for um, their babies. And this is good for me to know too, as I'm expecting, and I'm learning a lot of new things. But things like uh, you shouldn't co-sleep with your children, you shouldn't place any blankets or toys in the cribs. So as part of this initiative, Delta Children is donating 400 cribs to Brooklyn. Um, and we are looking for you, on you, counting on you, the community boards, to partner with us to identify families. So what we're gonna do is, and you'll be receiving an email from me shortly, later on this week, uh, we're gonna give each community board 18 cribs uh, so you can work with your community-based organizations, the ones that are on the ground, to identify these families. Uh, we're going to work with you and coordinate on delivery and uh, making sure these families get their cribs. We believe that it's easier to work with you because, you know, these cribs are obviously big. They're, they're boxes. Um, and a lot of families in need may not be able to come down to Borough Hall to pick them up. So we're going to work with you very closely to make sure that we identify these families all we're asking for is for you to identify 18 families in your community that can really use and benefit from a crib. Uh, you'll be hearing more from our office later this week, and if you have any questions, you can always reach me. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you so much. Are there any questions regarding the Sleep Safe initiative? Okay. So now, thank you so much, Italia. Now I would like to invite the district managers to make announcements or share any information with us uh, this morning at this time. Yes, Community Board 14. I just wanted to announce that um, on May 7th, we're holding our 7th Annual Youth Conference at Brooklyn College Student Union Building. Um, we've had great participation from a number of agencies here today. President of the Lady Eli C.D. Stanley Richmond, um, thank you very much in advance. And I know it will be a great event last year. We've had 45 organizations this year, already about 50 signed up. We had over 600 students join us that between the ages of um, 12 and 20. Um, Thank you so much, Sean. Do you have flyers for that? I have flyers. Fantastic, have even better. Too. Fantastic. So we would like to, God bless you. We would like to, are there any other announcements? Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. I learned uh, this morning that the DEP and DOT commissioners are having a press conference in my district. I learned this information out from uh, transportation alternatives. So I would like to uh, tell my friends at DEP and DOT that I'm starting to be reminded of uh, the previous administration, and outreach should be uh, uh, very important to this administration. Do we have, uh, as far as uh, DOT and DEP, the opportunity for communications with community boards when there's press conferences, what is the protocol? Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Shane Ojar. I'm the Director for Community Affairs at DEP. The press protocol, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Madam Deputy, is based on who is the lead for a particular uh, initiative. Um, this initiative is a safe, the Safe Work Zone Initiative. It is a joint uh, initiative between Canada and DOT, DEP, um, you know, so at this point, you know, we were not the main drivers of it, so I couldn't tell you exactly in terms of who was the lead, in terms of who was invited, who was not invited, we were asked to participate. Who was the main driver? Um, I believe, not that sure, I believe it was actually part of City Hall, so, I mean, I can confirm and get back to you. I but, appreciate that. You know, a lot of it is if, if there is an initiative that is owned, say, by DEP, with a new uh, construction project that's just wrapping up, we have reached out, we do reach out to the community boards, ask them for, you know, quotes, ask them for, you know, attendance at specific events. I mean, Craig has been with us uh, at the Gowanus facility. Um, so, I mean, it's not that we, we don't certainly make an effort to invite and involve our community board uh, leaders. I, I appreciate Shane, what you're referring to, and uh, Jeremy, we will reach out to City Hall on behalf of the Borough Board, um, because if it impacts you today, tomorrow it'll be another community board, and we want to make sure 
that oversight uh, does not occur again. Um, we will speak to uh, the Legislative Affairs Unit in City Hall. Um, John Paul Lupo, who's very familiar with uh, Borough Hall, will be receiving that call from us. Thank you very much. And at this time, I'd like to invite uh, our presenters, beginning with Shane Ojar from DEP. Um, our first agenda on the item is the notification of required sewer rec rec reconstruction projects. This, rep this presentation relates to concerns that were expressed at the last several meetings by district managers about DEP's protocols for notifying community boards about planned and emergency sewer work in each district. Shane? Okay, thank you again. Um, thank you. So I'll keep it short because I know everybody here is really interested in the Think Brooklyn presentation, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep You'd it be brief. surprised, Shane. <laughs> You'd be surprised. We, we want to hear from you. <laughs> um, so I don't know how far back to go, so I'll, I'll keep it brief and you can ask questions, uh, but I'll give you some of the background for, for this and what transpired basically last year uh, between DEP and um, most of the uh, district managers. <coughs> So in the past, DEP had provided uh, a document that outlined upcoming work, sewer work, repair work. Um, in that document, it was, there was no timeline of when the actual work would be done. Um, it was just, that was a document that said this work was in the queue for construction. Um, we, we stopped that in 2012. Um, we decided to look at how we would do the perform community notification in a sort of more relevant way, meaning that pertinent information in terms of when, where, how long, what the impacts would be, because that previous notification did not give any sort of information that was relevant, or not, not I wouldn't say relevant, but it, it missed a lot of information in terms of where the work would be, not where the work would have been, but how it would be impacting the community, what time frame, um, what sort of uh, traffic impacts, uh, water main impacts, and so we worked on developing a protocol internally, and I'm not proud to say that it took a lot longer than I would have liked it. We had a lot of internal discussions. Um, Josephine was the lead on this and really prompted us to really get our act together and really progress it a lot faster than you know I would have liked. Uh, I hoped it would have been. So what we ended up doing is last year, we developed a template um, and a protocol internally where we would be getting the notification from the construction group. And what happened is we have been doing that at late last year into, uh, and, and currently are, are actively doing that. So I know some members have reached out to senior staff at DEP to say that this is not happening. Um, so what I wanna do is I've brought basically all the Brooklyn notifications that we've had, and I'll just pass it around to all the different board members. So this is for Pearl. You could. This is for Pearl. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there's it. Melinda, so this is, can this you do is me all the documentation that we've provided beginning of, this is for this year. We did some last year too. But I have all of this, <laughs> and these are for all the boards. Mm -hmm. Okay, not every single board here is represented, and I'll clarify that because we, do, we don't have work in every single board every single week. Correct. So it's a function of where the work is, we notify people. Correct. So what you're handing out, Melinda, yeah, this, if you could this, just take. What I'm, ha what I'm handing out now is what's been handed out. Where's Jerry? Jerry? What's been Melinda, emailed to. Melinda, can you take to, those? Are, are, those, so those, are those handouts? Why don't, I, for, why don't I do this? I'll give it to you. And if you, you could give it to Melinda, okay. I've called Melinda two times so that you can give it to her. Okay. This is all, and Denise Hubbard here is our Brooklyn coordinator. Mm -hmm. So Denise is really the person who's been instrumental in mm -hmm. providing everybody with the information. So we have a template, we update the template based mm -hmm. on the information we have from the construction group. We send that out. It's gotten a lot better where we actually have been given a lot more time in advance. So we actually now have a sort of a one week window where we notify the boards one week in advance. Um, Beyond that, it gets tricky because this is not like a DDC project where it's not scheduled and we come to do work. A lot of it is dependent on 
site factors, either coordination with Kyan Edison. Sure. Um, weather obviously is a factor, especially over the winters. So I, I think, and I've spoken to our senior staff, and this is really coming from our office, I think what the boards now are getting is something that they've never gotten before, which is pertinent information, relevant information in terms of when the work is happening, where it's happening, how they will be affected. Um, and I believe it's a good system because they're getting the information that they need. They can share that with their constituents. Um, just because a board has not received anything does not mean that we're not doing the job. It means that there's no work that's been scheduled since we've started this process. Okay. And is, is any of this information on your website? No, we, unfortunately, it's, it's, we haven't worked out a system where we can put it in and update it in a very on, you know, uh, uh, real life, real life time uh, uh, process. Um, that is something that we're looking at in terms of how we would facilitate that. At this point, it's emailed out that same day to the boards. Denise actually most times follows, uh, performs a follow-up phone call mm -hmm. to make sure that they've received the information and just if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. um, so in my opinion, and I, I've, from the boards that have actually received it, I've received no comments or no complaints about the process. From the boards that have not received it, yes, we've received calls, but it's not a function of that we're not doing the work in, right. we're not performing the, we're not living up to the commitment of what we, we had agreed to. It's just a function of that there's no work actually at that point. So when there is work, we will certainly notify people. Okay, so I'd like uh, to open the floor for questions, comments. Yes, Community Board 9. The ones sewer project from January, and yes, I was aware of it in just enough time before it actually started. We've gotten better since January. Yeah, but, but the, my thing is, and, and it seems as though that, that this would just totally cover everything, and it doesn't. Because I spoke to Denise just a couple of weeks ago about the guy for the next street. What? And where, the, the gentleman on pres the homeowner on President Street that that's on that's President Street you said before? President, yes. Mm -hmm. It's in my district. So the guy has flooding in his basement, whatever, and you know, he, he got a plumber, they looked at to see if it is his stuff, but it wasn't his stuff, it's DEP stuff, they're gonna it's a really major thing and they're gonna that is important. I, I shouldn't wait for him to call me to say, you know, this thing happened, somebody came out, you know, they they said, we have to do big work here. <laughs> that's as far as the, we got, and, and that's only him. You know, everything that has to do with any flooding, any backups, any any breaks, any whatever, that, that we want information on that. We don't want to know an official DEP capital project only. So what you're talking about is almost impossible for us to do. What you're asking us is almost impossible. You're asking us to give you information on every single sewer backup, every single time we go out into the field, do a catch basin cleaning, do a, I mean, rea realistically, that is impossible. So we have a system in, this, in place now where just as we would do for capital work, or, or DDC does, for an extended block that will experience impacts for four or five, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. We are certainly prepared and committed and have staff available to do that notification. And we think it's a worthwhile use of, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we need to be doing because you have a large segment being impacted. In Shane, if I could just interrupt for a moment, so, but this is instigated because the homeowner right. has flagged it as a problem right and right. so in those in those cases mm -hmm. there is no nope. charter <laughs> mandated notification no, and, to and, the community board and and so I'll explain also to why in one sense I mean I, I mean I couldn't say why all the way back to the charter but right. at this point in time we're actually working with the resident who is affected so we're not you're not responding. With that right, we're responding. So if you, your cable goes out, Time Warner Cable is not going to call Pearl to say, oh yeah, this person had, uh, thing had the cable turned out. We're just going to go fix the cable. And problem. so let me just, um, uh -huh. just 
going back to what was the original notification on what is work being done in the district as it pertains to the charter, 10 days notification minimum. For capital is, construction. For capital construction is what is required. And that's what we're doing at this point. I just wanted to make sure that. I'm sorry, that's not, that's not what, I, what, what you're saying, Shane, is not what I'm no, I know what you're talking about, and that's not capital work. That's Pearl. I so I just did, which is that at this point, every single notification. Well, what are you talking about? I, I used this this one gentleman as an example of of where because it's a deep problem, I'm, I'm just letting you know after I insisted, by the way, that it was more than whatever the notes were that the police was telling me about. And I said, you know, I asked her, I said, I need to know, because no one is, is, is that well, some people are, but they're not crazy enough to come and complain about a, a, non-existent, a non-existent problem that continued. So I spoke to the and she did do that, and she really, she really does work with us. But the thing is, she spoke to the supervisor, whoever, the yard manager or whatever, and, and he said, yes, there is a serious problem there. And that was the last I heard about it. And the guy called last week to ask me, so what's going on? Now, now I have to go call you back and say, you know, we spoke to you about this a month ago, and you know, where are you guys after this? I mean, it's, it's an expectation that you have updates on something that really impacts a constituent, a taxpayer. I mean, I'm, and I'm not disagree. I'm not disagreeing with the fact that you know maybe we didn't respond fast enough. I mean, that's certainly something that we'll look at. I mean, I'll see. We we our group community affairs is reliant on the yard providing information. So at certain points, when we don't have information, I mean, it's not right that we don't get back to you and say we don't have it. I think we should just do that. I mean, and I've and you know we can talk after offline. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Borough President, Deputy Borough President. I just wanted to um, review the section of the charter. Um, you mentioned earlier that it was for capital projects, and that's not what is spelled out or has been my understanding for quite some time as district manager. And prior to the, the change in um, the notification procedure, we, we received notices directly from the yard, which, while it wasn't optimal, um, any sewer break, we, the boards were notified of. And even if it was weeks or months in advance, we knew it was out there. And, it, and when we saw trucks arriving, then if we had questions, we would reach out to our liaison. And I felt the system worked well, certainly could be improved, um, and I still think further can be improved. Um, so the charter section says that section 86, Except in the case of an emergency, no person, agency, business, association, or corporation shall remove the pavement, disturb the surface, or otherwise open or close a street, road, or highway until a written notice is filed at least 10 days in advance of the intended action with the construction coordinator and consulting engineer for the borough and the office of the borough president and the office of the district manager for the community district in which the street, road, or highway is located. And, and primarily most agencies, um, you know, some do it better than others. Um, you know, for example, Time Warner Cable, I think, is the best um, from my perspective because we get notices promptly within 10 days. But I, I would say from July of 2012, that has changed for CB10 because we have not gotten notices. We haven't received one notice um, So, Josephine, you. you, to be honest, you received the other notices, those cut sheets. I received the right. cut sheets. And those actually... Actually, we didn't live up to the charter then because we never gave you the advance notification 10 days in advance anyway. They were much more than 10 days. No, they were way in advance and they were never given a schedule. So the whole point. Well, we knew the work was pending. We knew the but work it was never coming. Was scheduled. I'm not going to debate with you because right now we don't know the work is so coming at all. At this point, madam, we're giving, we're actually living up more to the charter than we ever did. Okay? Is it exactly 10 days? It could be better, but it's certainly at least a week, which, you know, if you factor in, I guess the weekends, you know, would actually work for 10 days. But 
there's certainly enough time, and we're living up to the spirit of the charter, which is that we're pro providing advanced notification to the community boards that we are going to be doing this work. And some of this work, we actually, if you really want to be sticklers on the charter, is exempt because some of it is emergency work. So right, we but could say that we don't have to do anything. Okay? No, and you that still that have would be, to notify us, wrong, but not in writing. You have to notify be, us by phone. And that would be wrong of us in the sense that we're not trying to be difficult with everybody. We're trying to actually provide the information as soon as we get it, as soon as it's scheduled, as soon as it is accurate to a point where we certainly don't want to tell people, okay, we're going to come out in three months. We don't do it. So there's a certain point where we, we develop consistency and reliability by providing information in a timely manner. I actually, to be honest, don't know what the issue here is at a certain point, other than maybe you just want us to do something that, uh, to be honest, I don't understand. We're doing everything that we committed to last year, what I committed to last year with the, bar pres with the district managers. Um, we're providing the information in a timely manner. Um, I don't believe it's inaccurate. The people who have got it, Nobody's called me and says, Shane, this is completely okay. wrong or so, unnecessary. So, so, Shane, just one moment, because I, I want to be responsive in a, in a, in a constructive way sure. as to what the problem is. And so I want to allow Josephine okay. to address what her concern is so that we can mm -hmm. continue I'll the dialogue. Happy, I'll be happy to meet it. Sure. So I have, I have several concerns. The first being that we have not received notification about pending construction work within Board 10. Specifically, we had um, work done on Bay Ridge Avenue between 5th and 6th Avenue, as well as 6th Avenue at Bay Ridge Avenue. I was out just last week. Um, I was out in January. There was a DEP truck. I spoke to the DEP workers that were replacing manholes. They unearthed the street. All four catch basins were sunken in. We filed 311 complaints. Um, I was notified, and I, I do communicate with Denise, and Denise gives me back information. And unfortunately, a lot of the information I feel that is provided to her is inaccurate. Because information that we get from DEP that, it, that there was a job, it was completed, and DEP is out of there and work is over, and then you go to the scene because you get community complaints, and you see how DEP, what they consider a closed job. And just to show you, this is a catch basin in my district and how it was left. This is unacceptable. We didn't even get a notice that they were doing this work, we're doing the repair work. We're able to file that and funnel it through 311. But if I didn't have residents to call me to say DEP was out there and they were digging the street and they left it like this, I can't respond. So getting those information is helpful because as district manager, I go out and I, I take a look. I also keep track for our budget priorities. So that information is very important to us to obtain, to do our job, um, to do our charter mandated responsibility. And I, and I do feel there are communication issues between agencies, between DEP and DOT. And that's probably for another day. But I think first and foremost, the notification process, um, I understand many boards have received this. I don't think it's all the information that we had requested in our letter. Um, that's number one. We did request a diagram, which was helpful. That was in the original um, SRNs that don't appear here. Um, I think 10 days notification is, is, um, is what's required and is what should take place as best it can. I think a little bit more information about um, what type of job, what type of break would be helpful to us um, to be included in, in these. And I also think that the period of time where the notices lapsed from July of 2012 to present should be forwarded to each board so they can know what, what capital work was done within their respective districts. So those were so the first point three she, different yeah. points. Mm -hmm. So it's the first point that you mentioned about the catch basins. So the issue here, it's not necessarily a concern of you, but concern for you. It's our concern and how we have to address it. So internally, the work is done by different groups. Mm -hmm. The work that we are sending out the notifications for is done by the emergency construction group. So they have a contractor on board, they come out, they schedule the work uh, three months in advance. Once we know a week or two in advance or a week in advance, we certainly prepare the notification, send it out. The issue here for catch basins and some of the other manhole work is done by the yard. I know it's none of your concern in the sense that you don't care behind the, the, the curtain how it actually operates, but well, I'm just explaining Shane, just to, just to share with you, we do care in the sense where there was a time in the city of New York where HPD would respond to, I'll give you an address, 
415 Central Avenue, six apartments, many different complaints, and they would attend to what would be each singular mm -hmm. complaint. Okay. So it could take five years to visit what would be three different complaints of serious violations in one building. Okay. No, and not... multiple visits as opposed to, which is what we addressed in the city council, going in and from roof to cellar, visiting that one address mm -hmm. because they were able to extract and purge all relevant complaints to that one address. And the issue is the fact that we were spending much more manpower and resources visiting the building multiple times as opposed to doing it once with quality. And so that is what I'm trying to understand, whether or not your internal right. process is delaying or, or hemorrhaging what would be the opportunity to fix the problem because there's multiple departments within your department right. that need to come in as a team right. to be able to address the issue. So, okay, all right, that's fine. So I'll, that's a good analogy. So the, the issue here, we have different groups that perform different work based on the criticality and the sort of extent of the work. Catch basins tend to be done either cleaning or sort of resetting the, the grades tend to be done by the yard which are each borough has a yard or several yards within that borough and they have staff assigned, construction staff, uh, maintenance workers and they are called in based on tickets that get reported or visual inspections that we perform. Those guys will go out, fix the catch basin, reset it. That certainly is not really This was acceptable. more than a catch basin job. It was an 80 foot trench along Bay, Bay, uh, Bay Ridge Avenue from 5th to 6th Avenue and two manhole covers okay. and four catch basins. This was a large job. So when was that? This was January of 2014. It started in September, January, was the manhole cover at okay. 6th, 6th Avenue and Bay Ridge Avenue and the catch basins, I was there last week and they were all dug up. Okay, so Madam Deputy, the issue here, so there was a period where we weren't doing it and we had started it and we decided to not go back and backdate any of the notices because we just had to make a point to start and not cut off anything. So we started this late November, I believe it was. Um, and I had, I had reached out to Josephine and said, this is pretty much what we're going to be doing. Uh, Jimmy Roberts, Deputy Commissioner, responded in a letter to the district managers basically saying that this is going to be happening. So at a certain point, work that had already started before the process started, we weren't able to go back and re-notify people that this work is happening. So some of it, unfortunately, fell through at that point. So for Josephine's example, yes, that was work that would have been done if we started, you know, in November. But it was started in September, so unfortunately we didn't do it. So in if that happened this time now, you would have been notified, you would have gotten notification, and we would have all been in agreement that this work is moving forward. The condition of the work, Denise and I will certainly look at that and see because it's not acceptable to have some sort of that's really a sub a substandard uh, repair. Maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe there's, there's work that has to come back because typically we'll put in either patch. doesn't look like there was temporary patch there. But we'll come back in at a certain <laughs> later date once either the weather uh, gets better and we would put in a permanent asphalt or permanent uh, roadway uh, repairs. I also put this in a letter to um, then Commissioner Strickland in January and, and didn't receive a response. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll and you know that's a that's problematic. I do like to occasionally for large concerns. I like to get it in writing. Um, I like to send out. I have I have yet in the, the last administration to receive a response in writing. And recently, my council member echoed one of my letters that we were frustrated that we didn't get a response because we do work together. Um, and he was responded to in a very timely manner, which I'm appreciative of. Although, again, for another meeting, um, that the information is not accurate. But I want to stick to the notification process. And my colleague has a question. Thank you. Basically, the protocol that you put in place um, needs to be improved upon. We had a major capital project um, initiated in my district on Bath Avenue in late January, early February, and we were first notified in March. The, the, that, that, sorry, I'll just clarify. So those are two different projects, and 
I agree yeah. it was not, so I'll explain this. So this goes back to the different groups within the EP. This group, this is for the Avenue V uh, pump station project. So there's still some work that needs to be done. This work was being handled by another group. And we typically work with that group, and they, are, they have been providing us information. We have been going out to different community boards. We've gone out to, uh, certainly for Newtown Creek, we've gone out to board one to present to the aeration building. Um, for Marnie's case, she's absolutely right. She did not get the notification, absolutely. After looking at it, when she brought it to our attention, she was contacted by Con Edison. Perfectly acceptable for her to be upset. I have no problem with it. We went back and looked and see exactly, first of all, it's sad in the sense that when we ask certain people what's happening, they say, I don't know. So it's a little bit of an investigation process, so we found out, you know, later that day, who was responsible for that work. It was uh, another bureau in our group that was doing the Avenue V uh, pump station work. We certainly, right away, returned Marnie's phone call. Denise and project staff met, I think, a week later explained Shane. what was happening, Shane. and we've been meeting with her on a regular basis now. Um, and it's not optimum, I agree. It's not the way it should work, but we reached out to that group, and we have a system just similar to the other notification system that we'll be putting in place so that incidents like from Arnie's case with Bath Avenue don't occur anymore. Shane, uh, first let me thank you because you have been responsive I'm now. Glad. I'm glad to hear. Now. However, before that, I mean, we have a segment of roadway. I mean, you took the project, took 50 parking spots, meters. There was no preparation coming into the job. And that's important. It's not that we want to know because it's a, a struggle, a power struggle. It's because we, we're we here to advocate I, on behalf of our merchants I, and residents. I, I, I and completely if we agree. So, so what I'm saying to you is the procedure going forward, no matter what division it's coming from, it, something needs to be put in place. It doesn't matter whether it's catch basins, it's sewer reconstruction, it's an emergency job. There needs to be a central point where that information is sent out to the community boards so that we can do our job. We're not fighting with the agency. We just need to come to a point where we need to work together because at the end of the day, we're looking at the best interest for our sure. community. I, and, and, and that's we, the point. We are, I completely agree. I mean, as Jerry and I, Jerry Esposito knows, when I first started working, I was a community liaison, and that was my task, to provide community information in a timely manner. It's been ingrained in me. I've been, it has it's been a struggle at DEP in one sense, because there's, you know, there are systems in place that we have to change behavior and it's slowly coming. I've been there for two plus years, yeah. and I think it's gotten better. So I, I, I can honestly say, and I would, be, I would put my reputation in line, if you think it's been better, it has not gotten better since I've been here in January of 2012, you can let me know. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, we're gonna go this way, so that, um, and then we have another question in the back. <laughs> They, they have a list of the hours of construction. Uh, will water be turned off? What can I expect to see? And those answers on my sheet are general boilerplate. You may see at certain hours, there could be. And so it isn't specific to the job. There is also, and, and we did raise the issue of, um, of mapping or the location of the work to be done. My, my one single notice um, has the corner of Avenue M and East 18th Street even knowing northeast, southwest, which corner, because one is a school, one is a business, the other one is a place. So that, that specificity I don't think is too much to ask, and it was actually verbally offered, or you know, you confirmed that we would be able to get that information. Um, some of the information, just to reply, some of the information we don't have at that time. Some of the information, and we can certainly follow up at a later date, later like next day, or once we talk to the construction guys and get a better sense, because sometimes they give this to us a week in advance. They have not actually determined, you know, they know the limits, generally limits, so they don't know where they'll actually be placing equipment, what manholes they'll actually be using to enter the, the sewer. So a lot of that gets worked out in the field. We'll let you know as best as we can. I mean, you know, so I, I, I understand. I mean, I don't disagree. You don't disagree with? Well, being more specific. I mean, at some of the information we don't have at the time that we prepared the notice, which is why we sort of outlined that 
there may be water main in, uh, service interruptions, there may be parking that uh, may be removed, sometimes it's not parking, so that's removed. Some of it is field conditions that the contractor will come and determine once he gets out there, like a day before, he'll apply for a permit from DOT to remove parking at a certain location. Sometimes it may not be necessary. Um, so sadly, yes, the notices can be more specific. We just don't have the information at that time to tell you this is what's actually going to happen. Yes, yeah, we can do that. Sure. And so the prior notification, were they better or worse? Or you're indifferent to the prior notification? I, I, I've not been a district manager long enough to have ever experienced notification. The prior was helpful when the notice came in and the diagram was extremely important. The diagram, yes. The diagram. So we'll we take that back. I mean, we had discussed that with, uh, with senior staff. Um, so we'll take it back and we'll see. Is that a no? Because you took it back once before in November. It's now, you know, many, many months after. It's a different We've heard we'll take it's a it back many times. It's a different so, administration. Josephine, um, I want to just express to the district managers that we will follow up with a letter so that Shane's job is supported with the request formally from Borough Hall. And we will make sure that we make the request in writing mm -hmm. uh, to the commissioner um, has Commissioner Emily Lloyd, Lloyd? No, I know who she is. <laughs> she started, right? She started two okay. weeks ago. Yes. Okay. The, I uh, wanted March to just 7th. make sure I wasn't. Yes, um, no, she's, she's there. Okay, fantastic. So we will make sure that Commissioner Lloyd receives uh, this letter um, and uh, thanking both of you for your attendance here and addressing these issues. Yeah. And we understand that um, there has to be a formal request so that you are able to better address this matter. Um, the suggestion of a map, um, I have a copy here of what is the uh, prior notification and without the map, you know, it's I'm sure going to be uh, less accurate to be able to communicate where exactly work is getting done or needs to get done. Um, so I wanna make sure that we have the ability to help you help us. So if that is something that you can take back, that we reinforce it. I appreciate that. So I'm gonna have Leroy and then Henry. We'll stop taking requests. <laughs> For capital projects, I'll give you an instance on Henry Street, we're doing a sewer job on Henry Street, replacing the, the sewer. I mean, these technically are not capital per se, they're just reconstruction projects, I mean, semantics. What happens is you have the utilities that come in first to do their, their work, but the problem that we're having is that they don't always notify us when they're actually doing the work, and it's hard for me to find out sometimes who's responsible out there unless I actually go to the site and start yelling and screaming. But what I understand is that there is a meeting that you guys have with the utilities before the actual job gets started, where everyone is sitting around the table to discuss this particular job. Could we be invited to that? So the meeting you're talking about is typically on capital work, like say a DDC project, where we have a pre-construction meeting or a utility meeting. Um, we typically don't have those meetings for these types of work, for this type of work, but basically we'll let Con Edison know that this is happening. They'll go in, they'll have to either replace or move their utilities and then come in, but at this point, the level of coordination is really not that intense at, for these particular jobs. For capital work, say, you know, like Smith Street that all those years ago, yes, there's huge, enormous amounts because what will happen is after a while, kind of or National Grid or whoever it is may decide to upgrade their gas main gotcha. because it's so extensive. They were, they, they, for this particular job, they've had the meeting twice. Because oh, they have told me. Okay. And, and what I'm asking, when you do have those meetings, could we be invited to those meetings? I, I thoroughly enjoy going, and I get educated when I do go. And also, we get to meet the individuals who are responsible. Because then when there is a problem out there, and I go to one person, they said, that's not us, that's someone else. And then when I go to that person, they say, it's not me, it's someone else. That's a good system, and then I'm no? going, no, yeah, right. <laughs> and then I'm going back and forth trying to find out who's responsible, and a week has passed. Yeah, all right. No, so, so some of it, I mean, you know, you've been quiet, uh, Claudette. So some of it, you know, it, it's, it's, it, 
you know, the permitting process obviously goes through DOT. So as you, as you know, and you, you go online to the GIS map, and you know, so the permitting starts with, with that, with, with DOT. Um, you know, I'll, we'll take that back the, to you. The only reason I'm asking you if we could be invited is because the, the, the job, actually, the reason why they're changing everything is because of the DEP work. They're not changing it because they want to. They're changing it because they have to move it out of their way. Right. And, and, and from my perspective, you are the lead agency when it comes to that. Right. And so if you have those meetings, we would like, I would like to be invited. Okay. So. Yeah, either if, if not, that meetings will certainly come to the district service or, and update you specifically on what's happening. You know, have In relations to the, to yeah, the, for, for the utility work. work as well? Well, we can't speak for the utility that, work. That's, that's my point. So, So this initiative, which is the Green Infrastructure Initiative, as with most things with us, it's more complicated in one sense. So we, ha we are, as the lead, we provide the funding and we're, it's, it's our initiative to install these bioswales and other green infrastructure throughout the city. Well, specifically Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens. We're not doing it in Manhattan, Staten Island at this point. Mm -hmm. Because it's so large, we've actually broken up into four different group. So DEP is a lead on one in terms of managing it directly. DDC is another partner. Uh, Parks is another partner and EDC. So the location that you are in, CB3, I have to check and see. Who? No, but I mean, who's lead? You don't know, right? Okay. So we'll find out exactly. But the overall protocol is, yes, there should be notification. And we, un unfortunately, we've gotten complaints where the contractor did not and there's an uh, engineering staff that's associated with the contractor, and they're supposed to be going out and notifying the, the community uh, a couple days in advance that we're going to come and be doing these soil borings uh, for you. So yes, so right now, there should be the there, there should be notification. No, and this I'll have to find out actually what your what what borough we're the lead we're, we're the overall, overall lead. lead. We've broken it up for, in certain segments between DDC, well, different areas, different areas within the three boroughs that I mentioned, okay? I have to find out, I have to find out. So I don't know how I I'll get back, we'll get back to you today, as soon as we go back to the office. And Shane, can you just make sure that you CC us okay. on the remarks as far as uh, answering some of the questions so that we have on the record uh, who or what is the information yeah. that you said you would provide us um, so that we are able to include it as part of our notes, our minutes that are recorded. Um, okay. the, the program itself is a pilot and it's not borough wide, correct? Actually, well, it's not a pilot. This is actually the real deal. It's borough, it's, it's based on the watersheds that, uh, that are throughout Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx. So for, you know, Brooklyn, it would be Gowanus, Newtown Creek, uh, we would be doing areas in and around that. So the goal here is to reduce stormwater runoff into those water bodies. Mm -hmm. And what the bioswales do is basically capture the water, hold it for a period of time. Some of it drains out, some of it gets released. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you can only hold so much at a certain time because it's only, basically it's a, a very large tree pit. Um, so it is, not all parts of Brooklyn have bioswales or green infrastructure. Um, it's you know based on certain boards and Within those boards, it's within how the, the drainage system is, 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 is mapped so that we would best capture that water before it goes into the water body. And as far as the notification that Mr. Butler was referring to, mm -hmm. the issue of notification, is that through the community board? Is it, is it a notification to individual homeowners? Is it? We've assigned that notification. We will find out, Henry who exactly that project team is and who's managing that project and why they didn't receive the notification. Is there an, a schedule that is prepared? Right, so. And is that schedule made public for each community board that is impacted? Right, so there's no, there, there is a schedule. It's not a far out schedule that lays out, you know, three or four weeks in advance. Typically Correct. there's, because this is such a mobile operation, we will be there for 
half a day, right. we move on to another location. Some of it is dependent on what alternate side is, 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 exists. I mean, it's really down to that level in terms of where can the truck access and park on a particular street. I mean, it's, it's, we're at that level of detail in terms of coordination. Let me correct you, because they, they've done it on my block. And I actually, there actually was a notice out uh, a couple so, of days in advance. So some but of it's it not one day. It was three, four days. That's good. They're out there for three, four days, but they're testing every area. Uh, and I said, I mean, there's supposed so to be a one, protocol. They're supposed to be doing so it. So that one time we did, my block got notice, notification. But it's not a half a day process. It, it goes on for three, four days. Where they're out there right. drilling we do at seven in the morning, because you do multiple, multiple areas, you're trying to find the yes. best location. So in front of one person's property, it may be a day, you know, and then we'll move on to the next one. But yes, right. on that particular block, you're right. Yes. And of course, and uh, these particular is it is it a notification more than just drilling? So the notification is that you would see this truck take a boring sample. If it works and it's the soil can absorb a certain amount of water over a certain period of time. That location uh, gets slated for a bioswale. Once it meets other DOT criteria, such as you know uh, adequate sidewalk clearance, other utility, you know, not interference. Um, so this process is a lot of coordination between a lot of different agencies. It's not just okay. Well, we want to put it there, and we're going to put it there. We have mm -hmm. to find out if the location works in terms of drainage. There's no utility interference. There is not a fire hydrant. There's not some sort of curb cut. There's not there's adequate clearance that if we put in the bioswale that you would have five feet of sidewalk as the minimum clearance for. And I'm just trying to understand the notification process and exactly okay. how much notification and of what so is supposed to be expected by the property owner right. and so or community board. So we, we come out in advance uh, when we walk the site and we have a brochure, I'm sorry I didn't bring it today, but we have a, a brochure that explains what green infrastructure is and we give those to the adjacent properties that we're going to be targeting. So they get that in advance knowing that, okay, something's coming down the line. We, at that point, we don't have a specific date to tell them that we're going to do it three or four days. In advance, when we actually know that we're going to come to Henry Street or, or whoever street, we provide that information that, okay, in three or four days, we're going to come and do the test borings. In that first brochure, we explain the process because unfortunately, even if you see the truck in front of you, it doesn't mean that you will get a bioswale. You, you could, but you may not get anything uh, because it may not work, the site, the site may not work as a whole. Right now, right now, they're at the testing part right now. Right. They're testing the soil. I think the deputy is, is asking the notification. Is it a notification going to the residents stating that, okay, this week we're going to be drilling or it's a notification that's coming to the community board and we're supposed to let the residents know. Right. So no, it's not going to the community at this point, but we can talk to the dream. We can talk to that. It's not going to who? It's not going to the board at this point. So to we can. We it's can, going to who? It's going to the residents. Okay. So we can talk to them and talk to the engineers and contractors and we'll, we can certainly provide that information to them to make sure that the boards get copied and board, we get notified of what's happening. And, and that serves for what would be a fail safety measure, right? If sure. the homeowner didn't get the right, notification. If they were not there on vacation or something like that. At the very least, the board has been notified and can inform the resident impacted so that if there's any questions, they can verify. Sure. Um, and especially because, you know, there's been uh, a lot of crime represented by what would be uh, you misrepresenting what would be service um, individuals approaching what would be residences and claiming they are so-and-so for X service and lo and behold, it's a robbery. And so we want to make sure that there's um, information that's flowing through our community board so that there's an opportunity making sure that there's safety uh, no, I being applied. I, no, I, got, I understand what you're saying. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, there's, there is the temptation to abuse something like this. Absolutely. Or, or, or smart people can certainly look at it and say, I can, you know, figure Absolutely. out a way to con somebody. Right. And prey upon somebody. And Shane, I just wanted to share with you, I, I my block was uh, visited by this monstrous vehicle and there was drilling and my concern was the sidewalk not uh, being tampered with and then we would have to incur the cost of 
what would be a broken sidewalk. And so uh, I asked, because we did not get notification either. And the gentleman was uh, very thorough in explaining what the process would be like and that it would not um, do any damage to the sidewalk, to the concrete itself. And so I'm happy to hear that I was supposed to receive notification but didn't. And so now I will be on a lookout. Um, but it goes to show you, you know, beware of where you are because you're impacting many different um, individuals in Brooklyn, including the DBP. And so I'm not the exception to the rule, um, just sharing the fact that, you know, eyes and ears are everywhere. And we, as government, we have to make sure that we're doing everything possible to uh, notifying the proper individuals. Um, I didn't call my community board. Um, I didn't think anything of it. And today, this, because of the question, now I'm happy to know that I'm better informed. We, we have to have a better elected official database. That's what I think. I appreciate that. So. No, you're right. Um, I want to just express my sincere gratitude to DEP for being here. Um, I expect the answers to the questions and uh, some of the responses that you're going to be providing, but more so uh, the issues that have been raised here so that you're able to communicate them back uh, to your team and the division coordination um, to be improved so that there's uh, notification, proper notification, as well as uh, making sure that on our end, we're going to follow up with a letter to the commissioner so that you have um, a better opportunity to get the job done um, as we have requested it. Yeah. And we will now move on to our second item on the agenda, a presentation by Gretchen Manavel, Executive Director of Think Brooklyn. Um, we're happy to have her here and waiting so patiently. Um, Think Brooklyn was formerly the Center for the Study of Brooklyn, and Gretchen will be discussing how her center's work can help agencies and community boards use data to improve service delivery and coordination. So, as you can hear, a lot yes. of what... Very apropos of this Absolutely. So, Gretchen Manavel, please, if you can do so, uh, present, and I don't know if you need this mic or... You're gonna use that do, mic? Do I, do I need a mic? Yeah, yeah. I need a mic? Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy Borough President and uh, District Managers, City Agency Representatives, and I know we have a few uh, representatives from City Council here. Uh, my name is Gretchen Manival. I am the Executive Director of Think Brooklyn. Um, first of all, I just wanted to start off by asking how many of you use data now in your jobs? Show of hands. Okay, raise those hands high. We love data, right? How many of you actually like working with data? Ah, okay, all right, good, this is good, this is a start. So that's why we're here. We know that data and information is so vital to our communities, but at times it's very challenging to get the information we need, particularly if we need it at the neighborhood level, right? Because that's where we all live, we work, our community districts are at the neighborhood level, our children go to school at the neighborhood level, our houses are, and our communities are at the neighborhood level, so, Let's begin. Uh, Think Brooklyn, as the Deputy Borough President said, we are formally called Center for the Study of Brooklyn. Uh, our new name, Think Brooklyn, uh, Data and Strategy for the Social Good, we're actually scaling and replicating our work to all five boroughs of New York City in 2014 because we've seen such a need for the services and the information that we provide. So can everybody see one of the TV projectors here? And then you also have a printout here of the PowerPoint presentation. So feel free to stop me if you have any questions. I'm gonna move relatively quickly through the presentation and I'd love to engage you um, with some questions at the end. So Think Brooklyn's work um, is community driven and participatory. None of the work that we do is 
sitting in an ivory tower saying, hmm, we wonder what people are interested in. No, we have engagement with the community and community-based organizations, local government come to us and they say, here's what we need. And then we say, great, how else can we help you? So we provide access to affordable, rapid and reliable data analysis, data visualization, Assets and needs assessments, and I think this is particularly relevant uh, to some of the community districts, the community boards, strategic planning, program evaluation, and community resource directories. Our work empowers nonprofits, government, local businesses, media, researchers in New York City and beyond to develop f compelling funding proposals high impact and sustainable programming and services, and influential advocacy initiatives. How many of you are responsible for your district needs assessments every year? And are there data in those assessments? Is it tough to find the data, Jeremy? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's tough to find the data. Um, Sean had to, I think Sean Campbell had to leave, but she actually shared with me a few months ago that she uses our Brooklyn Neighborhood Reports for her district needs assessment. I'm seeing, yes, yes, that's great, that's great. Okay, so again, our approach is community-driven and participatory. Our constituencies are the experts. We are simply striving to fortify their already powerful voices. They're working in the communities. They know what their, um, what their neighbors need and we simply are a conduit to provide some of the vital information, again, at the neighborhood level and strategic thinking. So why are we doing this work? Are all of our neighborhoods in Brooklyn the same? Neighborhoods within neighborhoods? No, there are really, really tremendous disparities and a lot of inequities. But how are we going to be able to explain or articulate these inequities and get resources into our communities if we don't have information at the neighborhood level? If we just have data that's for all of Brooklyn, or even at the community district level, we drill down much more deeply at the census tract level, and we provide customized zones of need with information for the community-based organizations with whom we work. So vast disparities amongst neighborhoods, unavailable neighborhood level data means that important decisions about resource allocation, budgeting, programming and services, public policy, are oftentimes misinformed, they're not data-driven, nor are they informed by the people who it's going to impact. So this is where I think Brooklyn steps in. We combine the quantitative with the qualitative. So we don't just say, okay, here's what the data say and this is why we should be making decisions. We say, okay, community, here's what the data are saying about your community. Tell us what you think about your community. Tell us what you think what your needs are. Are the data accurately portraying your needs? If they are, great, but maybe they're not. And why, and what's different? And let's record that, let's get that in writing. So when we speak to our elected officials, when we go to um, trying to get resources allocated by foundations or the city, we're accurately equipped with the information that we need that's compelling. So here's where I think Brooklyn helps the groups that we work with. We mine and analyze public data, so we work with over 70 data sets, data from the census, data from city agencies. We also work with programmatic data, so if community-based organizations, city agencies have lots of data but they aren't quite sure how to analyze it or visualize it, make maps, um, graphics, infographics, we work with them to do that. We also produce customized data reports and the neighborhood reports which are circulated around here. Um, so we visualize the data, again, we have customized maps, we also have, um, we'll be launching our new website, 14 new reference maps, one for each of the five boroughs, and we know that community districts have certain boundaries, right? Then we also have city council districts, and we have United Health Fund districts, um, then we have zip codes. We have lots of different boundaries. And so when we're looking at the information, how can we possibly compare apples to apples if we're interested in information for a school district or a zone within a school district, and how does that align with the community district? So the place to start is knowing the geographies, and so we're gonna be providing reference maps. We're often asked for that. 
We also then customize maps. So we use the programmatic data or the public data to help show what assets are in a community, where organizations are located, and then maybe how the data align with those assets. So we can look at where there are deserts of services that are provided. We assess assets and needs. Um, we're in our third year of Promise Neighborhoods. Is any, has anybody heard of Promise Neighborhoods here? Jeremy has. There is one in Sunset Park. So this is a US DOE funded project and several other federal agencies as well. We've been awarded three here in Brooklyn over the last three years, which is really phenomenal. One in Sunset Park, one in Flatbush, and one in Cypress Hills. So we start the conversation by saying, okay, here are what the public data are saying, and then we host focus groups and town hall meetings, and we do extensive surveying. I think there were 2,000 plus surveys in Sunset Park to find out from the people who actually live, work, and go to school there what their needs are. We then do strategic planning as well. So we take all of this information and we say, okay, how are we gonna turn this information into action? How are we gonna come up with interventions and solutions for to meet the needs of our communities? And then at the other end of the spectrum, once we've done that, we work with groups and they say, okay, well, how well did we do? Let's, let's evaluate what we've done and then let's recalibrate. We did these things right, these things were a little bit more challenging. Um, so let's think about how to do things better next time. Uh, and then connecting with nonprofits and government. So um, when we were Center for the Study of Brooklyn, we had a Brooklyn organizations directory um, that had over a thousand nonprofits listed. I see people nodding yet. Um, so we'll have that again, and we're actually now mining the data and contact information for the other five boroughs of New York City. So there will likely be 5,000 plus organizations in this directory. We'll also have maps so you can click on a particular neighborhood and see what organizations serve that neighborhood. We also have a community board directory and an elected official directory. The reason that we have all of this information uh, on our website, I know that there are different websites with this contact information, but we thought it would be great to just have it all in one place. Um, so it's more of a one-stop shop. So in 2013, we founded Think Brooklyn. We are formally called Center for the Study of Brooklyn. During our tenure as the center, um, over the six years, we leveraged over $3 million uh, in financial resources with our community-based organizations, um, produced over 50 customized data sets, and responded to hundreds of requests for data, uh, and used over 70 data sets. The first ever Brooklyn Neighborhood Reports. Does everybody have a copy of all Brooklyn reports and Community District 8 as an example? There were also data tables that went with these. These data are now a few years old, and we're currently in the process of updating these to 2014 neighborhood reports. Um, if, you, if any of you are interested in learning more details about that, um, we're starting with the All Brooklyn Report and then working on the community districts one by one. Um, part of our model is going to be a subscription model. We're also hopefully getting some seed money, and we will be speaking with various groups and already are uh, in the relevant community districts about sponsoring a particular report. So if that's something that's of interest to a community board, um, I would love to talk with you about it further, so just let me know. And we also implemented, um, actually it's about 12, 13 at this point, major strategic planning and community assets and needs assessments. Uh, we had what, over 100,000 visits to our Brooklyn organizations directory. Looking forward to having that out again once we uh, launch our new website in the next month or so. Uh, and the first report of our Brooklyn Trends series. And then I already discussed the Brooklyn elected official and community board directories. Uh, and then we also respond to requests by media. Um, we want to be a resource to media so that it's not just sound bites, that it's really substantive information that they're providing uh, to their readers. And we're pleased to announce that in 2014, we're now serving all of New York City. Um, I talked a little bit of examples about our work, the Promise Neighborhoods Project. Um, we did the program evaluation for the New York City Food and Fitness Partnership uh, with bed Restoration. Um, worked with Heart of Brooklyn, which is six major um, arts institutions, to do a mapping project. Uh, and also with Coalition for the Improvement of Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, looked at their aging improvement district. So looking again at this very granular level of data, data at the census tract level, and they want to really target their programming and services block by block, which is called a saturation model, which is what they're using, so that they can have a really good idea of what impact their programming and services 
are making. So both for their aging improvement district and then our results-based accountability project. Um, we have lots of testimonials, which you can read at your leisure, about our work. So how can we help you? This outlines uh, what we've done in the past and what we will continue to do for different sectors. So the nonprofit sector, um, government, so of particular interest to this group, looking at constituency uh, assets and needs assessments, um, database design, data management, uh, and querying. Um, sometimes folk have really extensive databases and they can't figure out how to get back in there because the person who knew how to do it left three years ago and the data have just been sitting there unused. Um, they keep entering in information, but they can't get it out. Um, so we help crack the code with that. Um, program evaluation and performance measurement, uh, polling, um, public and program data mining, analysis and visualization, strategic planning and trends analysis. So for government, this can inform budget allocations, looking at what services are provided, campaign strategy, legislative testimony, policy making, um, and program and service development. And how can we help businesses, researchers, and media? So I'm gonna move through this very quickly. I wanna be sensitive to everybody's time. Um, so here are some data. These are examples of how we visualize the data. These are very, very basic data. Um, so we work with thousands of indicators. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but just to give you a sense of how we can articulate this visually through pictures and mapping. So Brooklyn has 18 community districts. Each community district has an average population of about 140,000. We all know there are about 2.5 million people in the borough of Brooklyn, seven, around 70 neighborhoods, um, 180 ethnicities, 130 countries are represented, and 90 languages spoken. Brooklyn's population has increased about 12% uh, since 1990. And again, these are 2012 data, and we're updating these data with our 2014 Brooklyn Neighborhood Reports. Race, oh, sorry, I was a little bit over-enthusiastic about the clicking. Um, race in Brooklyn, about a third white, a third black, 20% uh, Hispanic, and 10% Asian. Ethnicity, that big other 61%, right, that's accounted for because we have over 180 ethnicities. Um, but then African American, Chinese, followed by religious responses, and all of the information as you probably well know from the census, are self-identified, right? So people can either click on a box or they can write in what um, they identify themselves as in terms of ethnicity. Um, place of birth. So I like this infographic. We have the maps here so we can see that after New York State, which is about half of Brooklynites are born in New York State, the top five places of birth are China, followed by Jamaica, then Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. Does that surprise people? China? Yeah, that was interesting to me. Um, so this is, I really want to emphasize, and, I, and we do this with all of our groups, particularly when we're working with their community-based organizations and we're speaking with them to their funders. We talk about the volume, the numbers of people. We can say one-fifth of Brooklynites live in poverty, okay, but that's nearly 600,000 people. That's larger than most U.S. cities. So when we're looking to get funding into our communities from New York City government, New York State, at the national level, it's important to always really emphasize the numbers and the faces that go along with those numbers. One third of Brooklyn's children live in poverty. One third, that's nearly 200,000 children wake up every day in poverty. Brooklyn's foreign born, so nationally, there is about 13% uh, foreign born. In Brooklyn, it's three times that, uh, about 37.4%. Now this is so interesting. I did not know this until we ran these data. Nearly half of the foreign born in Brooklyn are not US citizens. So when we're thinking about services they might need and how to connect folks who might be concerned about connecting because of citizenship status, et cetera, that's really important to know. Also, in terms of language barriers, 10% of the foreign born uh, don't speak English. So looking at Brooklyn languages, about 50% speak English um, as their primary language at home. 16% is, what's hola? Spanish. 
That's right. 6.7%? Um, Chinese. Chinese. Are you looking at the answers? 5.4%? Um, Russian. Russian. Ah, Greek is a good guess, though. And 3.5%? Yiddish. Yiddish. Yiddish or Hebrew. I've had, a, I've had several rabbis say that some say it's Yiddish, some say it's Hebrew. <laughs> so I say, I say it's both when I do the presentation. So then we look at ability to speak English. Sometimes, often, we have groups asking us about language barriers for the constituencies they serve because they want to get folks on the ground who can communicate in the primary language um, of the groups who they serve. Um, oftentimes we're too asked, well, is Brooklyn getting its fair share? We're not getting our fair share compared to the other boroughs in New York City. And let's take a look at this. So, for example, through the arts, and this question was asked of us um, by the Heart of Brooklyn when we were doing some work for them over the last few years. So looking at 17, 716 arts and culture organizations in Brooklyn, um, and we look at 8.7 granted by uh, NISCA and NYC DCLA to about 282 of those, which is about 39%. Brooklyn per person, if we take all of Brooklyn and we say how much money we get for the arts in Brooklyn, it's about 3.43. And it's about twice that for all of New York City. So those kind of comparative analyses are, are, are pretty compelling. And this is, um, last part of the presentation is an example of mapping. So this was for Heart of Brooklyn, and this is called a, wait, I'm gonna ask, does anybody know what kind of map this is? Yeah? This is called a coral pleth map. And these are the maps that you see when, this is, these are the census tracts, right, the smaller squares, and the darker the census tract in this case, um, the higher percentage of um, people who um, don't speak, who speak English less than very well. Okay, so up in the top right-hand corner, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting, but if you have your presentation open, another thing that I always like to emphasize is that if we're just looking at the all Brooklyn level, we're gonna really miss the needs of our community because the percent change of those speaking English less than very well, if you look at all of Brooklyn, there's only been less than a 1% change. But then, if we look at even the community district level, first of all, let me just point out, this is looking at the membership rate of Heart of Brooklyn compared to those who speak English less than very well, so they could figure out what better outreach they could do using the native language of people who they wanted to serve. So their highest, Heart of Brooklyn's highest membership rate at 93.8 per 1,000 people was in Community District 6. The lowest is in Community District 4. Now, do you see those dark orange squares in Community District 4? That tells us, it puts up a red flag, this is an area they should be targeting because their membership is two per 1,000 people and that has a really deep concentration of people who speak English less than very well. And then the next slide we're gonna see is what language do they speak and how are we, what languages are we gonna do our marketing materials in and make sure that people speak when they go out into the community. So again, remember there was not even a 1% change for people who speak English less than very well if you look at the all Brooklyn data. Then if you look at by community district, what do we see here? 48%, 47%, 46%, 42%, 35%. So this is an average increase of 18% for these five CDs. So if we're looking at all Brooklyn, 1% change, language barriers, they're not really an issue. But if we're looking at the CD level, at the community district level, 18% increase in language barrier problems, right? So that's, and this can be said for hundreds of indicators that you're looking at. Indicators related to the economy, to employment, health. If we don't look at the neighborhood level, then we're not telling the full story and we're getting shortchanged on the money and resources and the programming that we have in our communities. Now this was the second map, one of the second maps that we did, and so this is primary language at home is Spanish, Chinese, or Russian, and those who speak English less than very well. So this is, okay, we know, again, let's look at Community District 4, Community District 7, we see clusters. So 
Spanish, 8.5%. Chinese, 4.8%. Russian, 3.6%. So this is a percentage of people whose primary language is one of these three languages and they don't speak English, or they speak English less than well. So again, looking up at Community District 4, and these pink squares are resources, these are libraries. These are public libraries. So Heart of Brooklyn thought, why don't we use public libraries as um, one of our outreach venues for folks? So that's another thing we could do is layer on maps what the community resources are. So not only you know what is the need, where is the need, how is that need defined, but let's start taking steps and strategizing how we can address this need. And Community District 11 is an interesting potpourri of languages spoken. So stay tuned, we'll officially launch our new website uh, in 2014. I hope in the next couple of months we're scaling the resources on our website citywide. Um, so we wanted to take a little bit more time to get those finished. Um, but thank you so much. And I wanted to just talk to you for a couple minutes to find out if you have any questions and to ask you if there are specific ways in which you think we might be able to be helpful in supporting your work, whether it's a city agency and you're trying to figure out how to merge your databases and connect and, and communicate information to, for example, community districts or community boards, or if you're a community board and you're doing your district needs assessment or you want to do a survey for your constituencies to find out what services they need for budget allocations. Um, so just any questions? Thoughts, ways in which we might be able to be helpful? No? I can say that at least from yep. our perspective at the Borough President's Office, we'll be definitely calling you a lot. Uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of things that you've already mentioned that the Borough President's talked about, things that he wants to do, mapping the borough, things like that. Um, so you can expect a lot of phone calls from us okay. moving forward. <laughs> Great, thank you. Anyone else, any questions? Is there a cost? There is a cost. So we're going to have a subscription model where we're going to provide a lot of these publications as packages or a per price. And then there is also a fee-for-service model for larger projects. Previously, we um, were, were funded so that we could do a lot of the work that we do pro bono, and we're still seeking those funds. So I'm hoping with our launch over the next year or so, we'll be continue able to do that. But that's our goal, is to be able to provide a good portion of these services and publications pro bono. Um, so in the interim, please feel free to be in touch if we can be helpful with any of your work. And what we've also done with groups is talk to them about what their needs are, and then we jointly figure out, if, if they don't already have funding lined up, what um, potential um, funding sources we can put in joint proposals to. And that's how we got the Promised Neighborhood grants over the last few years as we put in those joint proposals and then it was $500,000 per community. So pretty exciting. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much. Enjoy the day. Hopefully the rain will subside. <laughs> Take thank, care. Thank you, Gretchen. And we're just about wrapped up here. Um, so that concludes our agenda for, the, for this Borough Service Cabinet meeting. I just want to first recognize Councilmember Mealy's office, Robert Wiggins, who's, who joined us here. Thank you for being here. And at this time, we want to ask if there's any representatives from agencies, companies, or elected officials who have any information or announcements to share. Just say, state your name so we hear. Thank you, Ray. Congratulations. So this is the final announcement we have from Borough Hall. It's the Brooklyn Borough President Youth Softball and Baseball Leaders Meet and Greet. Um, the Borough President is eager to recognize the coaches, league commissioners, athletic directors that keep uh, our young people active and uh, participating in what would be constructive activity. And a lot of this is done because of many people.